My number one spotlight, big stage, 50,000 fans screaming in a rage, bodyguards and limousines. This is the way I see you in, in my, my dreams. dreams. Paparazzi flash, a hundred pictures, all of you hanging on my bedroom wall. I'm a kid again, I feel like 13, but I knew since we fell in love, girl, I'd be, yeah. I'll be your groupie, baby, oh, cause you are my superstar, superstar, yeah, I'm your number one fan, give me your, your autograph. autograph, sign it right here on my heart. I'll be, girl, I'll be a groupie, baby. Oh, oh, oh. Cause you are my superstar. Superstar, and yeah. you number one fan. And all that I can. This is for you. To show you how super you. you are. Let's start the show. Keith, Steph, how are you doing today on this beautiful day? I'm sleepy, like very sleepy, but with good reason, with great reason. So, oh, great yeah. reason. Yeah, great reason. All right. Um, well, what happened? You know, it's Essence Weekend. And mm. Pooh was allowing us to um, live stream the Essence performances. And until now, we said the only person I would stay up to the, into the wee hours of the morning to catch a concert of is... Beyonce, okay? Mm -hmm. But for the past two nights, Janet, Miss Jackson... The original had, queen. <laughs> <laughs> Stir it up, baby. Shouts out to Antoine. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, Janet's, you know, dancing, not singing, kept me up two nights in a row. Mm. Um, and no, no offense, Antoine, because I know I'm gonna catch it later. But oh, you same know, thing with Beyonce. Her you know how I, whatever. You know I don't play about Jay Z's wife. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, put some respect on Kelly's name. Go ahead. In all seriousness, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> the performances um, from the different artists were some were really bad, some were really good, and um, for two nights in a row, I was up until three a.m. or morning night. And it was all worth it. Shout out to D-Nice because he brought Carl Thomas out. And Carl Thomas killed it. Oh, baby, come this. to me. He's saying baby. can't believe. Faith wasn't there, but he uh, killed it. Jasmine. Is emotional? Yes. Summer oh, Rain. Man. I wish. Wow. Um, Jasmine Sullivan did a phenomenal job. But let me tell y'all something. Miss Patty LaBelle shut it down. Patty came out there with five different pair of shoe, pairs of shoes to change into mm -hmm. during her performance instead of just kicking shoes off. And honey, she had the queen herself, Miss Debbie Allen, come up on the stage and Debbie was twerking better than some 20 year olds. I know. <laughs> Debbie, listen, when Debbie dropped down on that ground on her hands and knees, I said, oh my God, Miss Debbie. Mm. But she killed it. And I mean, to say that she's been injured, her something's been going on with one of her feet, but uh, it didn't seem that way last night. Patty, you know, and I had to call my mom during the performance because Patty is her Beyonce. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So, mm -hmm. um, but uh, much respect to Miss Patty LaBelle. Yeah. 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 Time, timeless, timeless. Ooh. All right. I'm going to have to check that out tonight, too, because I think yeah. what new edition is yeah. headlining tonight. Yeah. And your boys, Drew Hill, were on last night, all 20 of them. And Oh, my God. 
it wasn't, it wasn't good. <laughs> Y'all, it wasn't good. It wasn't yeah. Good. <laughs> so Drew Hill has gone through a few transformations. It was Woody left, you know, one of the original four. But before he left, they did come out with their third album and they did add Scola on there, which I, I really enjoyed that album. That actually is my second favorite album of theirs. Mm-hmm. And then um, he left, Scola left, and then Woody left. He had been in and out of the group. And so then it was just down to the three jazz, Cisco and Nokio. And then Teo, they added this guy named Teo. I don't like Teo at all mm-hmm. because he oversings and he tries to oversing everybody. You know, um, he has one of those voices. I just don't, I, I, he doesn't blend well with the group to me. And then jazz left. I think jazz had got just a little bit too big to perform and then Teo left. And so then they added the two member, the two surviving members of the group Playa, you know, the group that sang the song Cheers to You and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, they were added, which was Smoke and um, uh, Smoke and um, God, I forgot the other guy's name. But anyways, they're part of the group. So then Jazz came back, Teo came back and Scola came back as well. And it's just been so disastrous with the performance because they're not in harmony. Mm-mm. Um, Cisco doesn't sound too good. He sounded like he had just smoked a whole pack of Newports. Yeah. Before he got um, on that stage last night. Yeah. And then you've got, um, you know, jazz is the best singer of the group. You know, funny thing about it is people – you know, when the videos came out, you know, sleeping in my bed and everything, everybody assumed that Cisco was the lead singer, which they did have in front and center. Right. But if you listen to all the albums, jazz sings more lead than Cisco does on the song. Five steps. Let me tell you something. Jazz has always been my baby. And if there's anyone listening to this podcast that personally knows him, tell him to call me. Oh Lord. Okay. So anyway, (laughs) So they've got a whole bunch of people on and it just doesn't sound good. But anyways, no. John, what's going on with you, man? How how has your week been? How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, a very uneventful work week. Uh, started off Saturday great. I actually uh, want to thank you two for suggesting listening to Usher's Tiny Desk performance. Ooh, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, as I was uh, whipping up some macaroni and cheese for my aunt's um, birthday that uh, happened yesterday so uh, happy birthday auntie robin Mm -hmm. and um it just made (laughs) my morning uh that much more uh, efficient uh Mm -hmm. listening to uh the nostalgia of usher and um the work that he has put out in 24 minutes and i was very upset uh that 24 (laughs) minutes uh elapsed so quick it felt like four so um yeah, that was a great start. Um, had a great time with family in uh, Titusville yesterday and uh, with the wife. Enjoyed the wife. Um, actually went out to the casino on Friday night. Had some uh, sushi. Hard Rock? And, uh, yeah, Hard Rock in Tampa. All right. Went out to Tampa on Friday night. So um, we, we did that. We played some slots. I lost 20 bucks. I said, screw it. I'm not putting any more money in here because uh, <laughs> I didn't want us to come to my impulse to uh, try to win the money back and 20 bucks and easily turn into 200, three, four hundred bucks. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, we dug up out of there, went to Cheesecake Factory, headed back to the house. So, yeah. You know, that's somewhere I can't eat anymore. I just really? went there for cheesecake. Yeah, I just go for the cheesecake. I can't eat the food anymore. Yeah, I haven't been like there. F- it's, very, it's very few and far in between when I've been there. What, what about the food can you not it tastes like they just dump a whole barrel of salt. Okay, that's what I was going to say too. Yeah, it's real <laughs> yeah. Salt. five thousand calories per plate. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. yeah. 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 So I just there. go for the cheesecake, the lemon raspberry, especially. Cheesecake is is very high calorie as well. Um, I found that out by Weight Watchers. Um, that it's a lot of points. Sometimes more points than the meal. I drink a lot of water. Yeah, it's not going to stop. I just drink a lot of water. (laughs) I figure if I balance it out with the water, I'm good. Hey, that's always I go to. I'm going to drink a lot of water. (laughs) (laughs) 
that. Room temperature um, water, that is. Room temperature. Got to be room yeah. temperature. Yeah. yeah. And if I know I'm going to Cheesecake Factory, I'm I'm not going to lie to y'all. I will eat that whole slice. And, you know, those are big slices. So I usually don't plan to eat dinner when mm. I do that. It's worth okay. it to me. <laughs> All right. Um. Yeah, John, that that Usher Tiny Desk, it, I mean, it 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 really just solidified. And I, and I actually text Steph this. I said, there's really, you know, there was a conversation at one point about a versus with him and Chris Brown. And, and no disrespect to Chris Brown because he's talented in his own um, way. But I I don't think there, there's two people, in my opinion, that could go toe to toe with Usher in a in a versus one is dead and one is in prison right now and that's michael that's jackson and, and r kelly um he 24 minutes was not enough time john at all absolutely right um and i was like okay it was just so many songs and i was like well he's putting a lot of he's putting his vocals on display so he has to end with climax right and he didn't and i was like damn i thought he would have ended with that but it just it, he was just singing so effortlessly um with his dr octavius dr Oc from <laughs> spider-man glasses <laughs> when i saw them shades on, i said you know what he coming out he's not coming to play with us today <laughs> not at all you know it made me a little sad because i was like dang i mean i've always loved usher but it made me realize I didn't appreciate Usher in my 20s the way yeah. I appreciate him now as a 40-something. So I'm yeah. like, dang. I, I didn't sleep on him, but I slept on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Understood. You Understood. and I both. I think that um, there was, a, at that time, mm-hmm. there was, a not to, not to diminish Usher, because I, I feel like looking back as a body of work from an R&B pop whatever you want to say i i think that there's you know he put on two back-to-back albums that i haven't seen an artist put on since michael jackson which is right. 8701 and confessions and Absolutely. going back to mj uh off the wall and thriller so it's just like wow i've never seen that body of work ever done and he did that i think that one thing that comes to mind with Usher is that he was always at the top of the pack, but you have to look at what the competition of R and B was back then. There was so much R and B music flowing through the nineties in the very early two thousands mm-hmm. that, you know, it wasn't like he was overlooked because I mean, confessions is one of the top selling R and B albums of all time. Right. But, you know, you, you had him come out with a song, you had R. Kelly come out with a song, you had Case, you had Joe, you had, you know, all these people coming out with music, music soul child. You know, all this music was just flowing from the male R&B side. And let's not even get into the female or the female R&B side of things, but it was just flowing from both sides. Same thing with rap music around that time, yes. you know. So it was just flowing. That's why. That's why. In my opinion, when it comes to rap music, there's so many people from our generation that they feel is the GOAT. You know, Steph, your favorite is Jay-Z. Mine, Mm -hmm. you know, was Tupac. Um, I'm not sure who John's favorite rapper is of all time, but, you know... um, we we it's so many because the music just was coming out so good and back to back and nobody sound the same right right you know everybody had their distinct sound they had their distinct way that they rap um you know of course their accent depending on where they were from and then also the produce the production that they used on their albums were unique to them um you know and and I and I try to you know, give a listen to the music out now. There's really no R and B out, and and, no. and again, no slight on anybody, but outside of a a few standouts, which is like Jasmine Sullivan, or, or you know, one or two of them on the woman's side of things. There's not all the R and B singers sound the same. Okay. Um, on the male side of things, they're trying to rap and sing at the same time, like they're Bone Thugs and Harmony. Right. So, you know, it's just, and then for rap music. 
everybody sounds the same. You don't know where they're from. You know, you can't tell that, you know, everybody sounds like they're from the South, to be honest with you. You know, you don't know if anybody sounds like they're from the West Coast, from the Midwest, from up North. Everybody sounds like they're from the South. Everybody's using the same beats. So I think that's why I wouldn't say overlook, but it's just, it was so much music out there. It was a stack Usher field back out. then. It was a huge stack yes. field back then. Yes. We were spoiled. We were truly spoiled back then. We Y'all want to know what's sad? Um, I was visiting a client one day, and there was some some boys, teenage boys, sitting outside on the curb, and they were talking. And I don't know what had previously happened where they saw him, but one of the kids, and if I had to guess, I'd say he was like 15, 16. He was like, did y'all see that old guy, that new rapper? And he's old. Why would you try to start a rap career at an old age? And so me being who I am, I said, well, who are you talking about? You know, just dipping in their conversation. When that little boy said, bust the rhymes, I said, no. son. I said, son, son. I said, where are you from? <laughs> mm-hmm. He said, I'm from here in Atlanta. So I had to school them on who bust the rhymes was. They were like, mm. oh, wow. really? He's not new? He'd never heard of Busta Rhymes before. Um, there were a few others that, you know, rappers that came up in the in the 90s, early 2000s that he never, that they'd never heard of before. And it made me sad. I'm like, wow, we're not teaching these babies who these artists are. Well, you know what's so weird about that is that mm-hmm. we knew what the generation of rap, who mm-hmm. they were before, and we appreciated them and respected them. It's just music has gotten into this phase of where let me put an auto tune to it and mm-hmm. put, you know, the same beat and it's cool. Right. You know what I mean? Like we don't actually have to have lyricism. We don't have a, a publication like the source great in our music. We could just come out and, you know, as long as it's catchy, you can sing along to it. It's cool. Yeah. And what? I'm like, how that that's baffling to me. Like they didn't know yeah. who Busta Rhymes is. Wow. I was low key offended. And I will say one thing I love about my nieces, my brother's three kids who are 17, 15 and, and 12. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I try to introduce them to music from our generation and they actually like it. They like it. Yeah. And so um, and they even like older music, like our parents music. So uh, what what had me cracking up was the other day my sister FaceTimed me and I heard the noise in the background. I said, what is that? So she said, hold on. So she went where the kids were, which they couldn't see her, you know, showing me. And they were in the kitchen, in my mom's kitchen, sing, singing A Change Is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. They oh, knew all of the words. Wow. I was like, why are these kids singing this song with so much feeling wow. <laughs> and my sister was like they like the song every day they sing it so i'm like you know what god i ain't mad at it that is amazing that it is, is amazing <laughs> um i think also a p- big part of why we don't hear so many good singers is that these kids don't go to church no more they don't that's just my that's my opinion that's where all the good singers came from and they you know but speaking of music let's go ahead and jump into this top 10 Last week, we did not get the top 10 in because we had a very powerful episode. Once again, thank you, Antoine, for coming on, joining us, um, talking about the overturning of Roe versus Wade. We had discussed that in a previous episode, 67, and so we were there. So thank you again for coming on episode 74 to talk about that. And so um, let's go ahead and jump into the top 10. Now, this top 10 was voted on by you guys a couple of weeks ago (laughs) and Steph was the one that picked the topics and I believe it was top 10 songs that we had no business singing versus what was the other one Steph that you picked? I forgot. Was it me Uh, or was it you? You picked No, it was me. I'm sorry. Oh my God. I didn't pick this. Oh, that's right. It was Mm -hmm. me. I'm so sorry about that. (laughs) It was top 10 songs. We had no business singing versus uh, top rap albums from 1999. And so this was the one that won. And we're going to go ahead and jump into the top 10. Now, next week's top 10 will be John's pick. So when this drops on Tuesday, please make sure to go to our social media accounts to vote. It will be up on Tuesday. John, can you tell them how to vote and how to follow us on our social media? Most certainly. You can catch us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter 
uh, for Facebook, just tag us with the short desk podcast on Instagram. It's at the short desk podcast and Twitter. It's the short desk. Uh, we will have the polls on all three of those platforms. Uh, if you want to reach out to us for show ideas or top tens, please email us at the short desk podcast at gmail.com. Uh, continue to download us at Apple iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Of course, on Apple iTunes and Apple Podcasts. Leave your five star ratings and your comments. And Spotify, just leave your five star rating and good pods. Also, leave your five star rating. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, and John, you go ahead and let everybody know what the top 10 will be for episode 76. What are the two options that they can vote on? All right. Once again, this will be on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. The two items for the top 10 shall be top 10 movie villains versus top 10 TV sitcoms. All right. And you guys, again, make sure you vote. They will be in our stories on uh, Instagram and Facebook and also on a poll up on our Twitter, our Twitter account. All right. So top 10 songs we had no business singing when we were kids. These are songs that were personal favorite of ours that we really had no business singing before we were 18 years old of legal age. <laughs> So we'll go ahead and start off with um, Miss Steph. You can be first. Okay. John, you can be second, and I'll be last. <laughs> okay. Steph, what you got? Well, for my honorable mentions, uh, here's the thing with the honorable mentions. For two, well, my first honorable mention is Creep by TLC. Hmm. The next two, I couldn't pick songs, so I had whole albums. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. The Doggy Style album by Oh man. Snoop Dogg. <laughs> it ain't and no fun. The Chronic by Dr. Dre. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I knew both of those albums word for word for word for word. And I had no business singing in those songs <laughs> at all. At all. So and my number 10 is Downtown by SWV. Ooh. Okay. Listen, I used to think that was about going downtown until I realized it was about <laughs> going downtown. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry, mama. Mm. But you bought oh, the yeah. album. You didn't know what was on it, but you bought the CD, ma. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> All right. John, you got any honorable mentions? Uh, you got straight to number 10. Uh, I got a few honorable mentions here. Um, Aaliyah age ain't nothing but a, but a number. Oh, uh, salt and pepper, push it. Woo. SWV rain. Oh, next, too close. Oh, 112 yeah. peaches and cream. Oh, my oh. word. Yes, yes, yes. My number 10 is uh, Snoop Dogg's Ain't No Fun If the Homies Can't Have None. Oh, man, <laughs> when I met you last night, baby. Hey. <laughs> I'm oh, mad I started dancing. That's my, one of my favorite songs on that album. Yes. Oh, yes. man. All right. Good list, y'all. Yes, who's back? Okay. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> nope. It's Sunday, y'all. It is. It really is. Okay. My honorable mentions list I have Freak Me Baby by Silk. Oh. Mm. Uh, I wonder if she could tell I'm hard right now. Hmm. Too close by next. <laughs> uh, Rain by SWV. And when I found out what that song was about as a man, I was like, oh my God, how did I sing that song? <laughs> <laughs> um, Bump and Grind by R. Kelly for more than just one reason. Mm -hmm. Naughty by Nature, OPP. Forgot Who about that. Yeah. <laughs> Uchi Wally Nas. Wow. And uh Effing You Tonight by Big N R. Kelly. I used to mm. sing it loud and proud back in nineteen ninety six, I think, or ninety seven, one of them when it came out. Yeah. Okay. Number ten. Do me baby by Bill Biv DeVoe. Hey. I had no reason. No. 
singing this song like this. I think I may have been in elementary school when this song came out. So, yes, "Do Me, Baby" by uh, "Do Me" by Bill Bill DeVoe. Mm-hmm. Steph, what you got for number nine? Number nine, I have "Red Light Special" by TLC. Woo! Woo. I, I actually thought it was talking about a red light. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Okay. John, what you got for number nine? I have TLC, Ain't Too Proud to Big. Oh. Hey, listen. Oh, Jesus. I forgot about that song. Not wow. me. Not me. I, had, I, I wrestled that one. It didn't make the list. It was that or Creep and Creep One for my honorable mention. So, mm. yeah. Number nine for me is Knocking the Boots, H Town. Woo. I used to sing that loud and proud. <laughs> Yeah. Number eight. What you got, Steph? I have Bump and Grind by Robert Kelly. Oh, man. Okay. All right. What you got for number eight, John? LL Cool J doing it. Woo! Listen. Y'all, my daddy caught me singing that one time. And what was the outcome? He turned my TV off. The video, <laughs> and I'm looking That's like I'm, you know, and I'm in the mind frame of I'm almost in college. He didn't care. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Number eight for me, a little bit of an old school classic, but I used to sing it all the time. Let's get it on by Marvin Gaye. Ooh. I had no business singing it. Number seven, what you got for number seven, Steph? Humping around by the King Bobby Brown. Oh, hmm. man, I forgot about that song. Okay. All right. John, number seven. Boys to Men, I'll Make Love to You. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a sweet song, though. Aww. Should have been singing it. <laughs> this is true. This is true. But it was so sweet. It was. It was one of the sweetest, inappropriate songs for kids. <laughs> Number seven for me is Freaking You, Jodeci. Okay. Sing that loud and proud. <laughs> <laughs> Number six. What you got, Steph? As We Lay by Shirley Murdoch. Oh, man. Oh, man. I don't forget about that. I used to sing that song with my whole soul out in my mama's backyard. I didn't know what I was singing. Mm. My Lord. My yeah. Lord. My Lord. Number six, John. Janet Jackson, anytime, any place. Oh man. Mm-hmm. In the thunder and rain. Okay. She did a good job with that last night, too. Mm. Did she play did she sing my uh favorite song? What? Um Come Back to Me. She sure did. Oh man. I, I hope Hulu is playing replays because I she did all the classics. Because you know, she was on two nights in a row. So, mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Number six for me. I'll make love to you, boys to men. <laughs> <laughs> Song that loud and proud too. Uh, number five, Steph. Number five for me, and I blame my two older sisters for me knowing the words to this song. Mm-hmm. Darling Nikki by Prince. Oh Ooh. man. I never got into that song until I was older, so I can't. Listen, that whole Purple Rain soundtrack. Come back, Nikki. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. Number five, John. Adina Howard. Freak oh, like man. me. Man, listen, Adina. Wowzers. You see, okay. Chloe Bailey did that at the BET Awards. Did she? Yeah. Oh, wow. She did a little piece of that. And I was like, okay, little Adina. Mm, 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 mm. Okay. Number five for me, Nice and Slow Usher. Mm. Ah. I thought it came out a lot later than what it did, but it didn't. So, yeah, I had no business really yeah, singing It came out song. my junior year of high school. So I was like 16, 15, 16, somewhere. Yeah, I think I was like 14. Yeah, yeah. 14, 15, one of them. Yeah. But I shouldn't have been saying it. No. <laughs> <sighs> Number four, Steph, what you got? Number four is Anytime, Any Place by Janet Jackson. Mm. All right. <clears throat> okay. John, what you got for number four? 
Jodeci, freaking you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Number four for me is How Do You Want It, Tupac? Hey. <laughs> Listen, that, that song wasn't inappropriate for me for the reasons it should have been. Him telling C. Dolores Tucker she was an MF. -er. Oh, was yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. She's deceased. That's so bad. That's so bad. <laughs> but that just goes to to show the lens, you know, of Tupac's I don't give a F-U-C-K attitude. And I love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Number three, Steph. Number three for me, um, I actually kicked Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye off the list for this one. Um, mm. Fiending by Jodeci. Woo, man! Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Number three, Steph. I'm sorry, John. As yet, last night. <gasps> oh, oh man. I forgot about that song. Wow. Yeah, wow. we were too young for that. Yes. Way too young for that. Highly inappropriate. This was on the radio. But we knew all the words. <laughs> all of the words. All the words. You most certainly did. Number three for me, and this one um, was before my time, Parents' Generation, but I still sang it loud and proud as a little kid and still love it to this day. Turn off the lights. Hey, Teddy P. And light a candle. Yeah, <laughs> Teddy P. Number two. What you got for number two, Steph? For number two, I have 12 Play by Robert Kelly. Woo! Yeah, right. He had no business singing anything, R. Kelly. Off that whole <laughs> album, okay? Uh, <clears throat> what you got for number two, John? Silk, Freak Me. Oh, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, When I was doing this list, my wife was like, well, you forgot about the other two Silk songs. I was like, baby, I think I was 18 at that time when they came out with If You and uh, Meeting in My Bedroom, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, because Meeting in My Bedroom came out my freshman year of college. So I was 18. Okay. Okay, you're so about, maybe I wasn't. About I thought 13. it came out in like 2000. Hold on, I'm about to Yeah, that's it. right. You are almost a senior citizen. I forgot. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you about to hit the 40 club <laughs> this year. Don't play. Yeah, yeah. Wake up and those knees are creaking. Oh, they've been doing that. <laughs> okay, it came out in 99, so my sophomore year of college, I was 19. Oh, okay, so I was 17. Yeah. Okay. Number two for me is Doing It by LL Cool J. Mm -hmm. I knew Ooh. every single lyric to that song. I it's think that's the, the episode when you and Iris opened with it. It, it was, was so awesome. dope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So dope. All right. We are to the end of this. We kind of shot through this like a breeze, huh? I know. No fights? None. None. Number one. What you got, Steph, for number one? Freak Like Me by Adina Howard. All right. Man. Listen, Adina on top of that car. Adina had me. We got played on the radio. Adina had me asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> Adina, listen, Adina is still fine. Let me put that out there. Um, yes. You know, but Adina had me asking my my older sister some questions. Um, <laughs> and they're just looking at me like, "Why are you asking me this?" But yeah, uh, really had no business. So but she she can still hit those dance moves, unlike genuine. But let's carry on. Po genuine. <laughs> Number one, John, what you got? Uh, Mr. Robert Kelly, bump and grind. <laughs> oh man, Robert. Mm 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 mm. mm. <laughs> That's what the court said. Yeah. yeah <laughs> they did. <laughs> Number one for me. And again, it was the lyrics of this song. I had no business singing it as young as I was, but rock with you, Bobby Brown. Oh, yeah. Mm. A lot of Bobby's music. Yeah. Yeah. But so. you know what bothered me about doing this list? Um, mm. As I was doing it, I was thinking back 
I was thinking back to the age that I was with each song, especially like with the chronic and doggy style. And um, mm-hmm. my little brother and sister are five years younger than me, and they knew all the words too. So when I was 13, they were about eight. Um, so yeah, I'm yeah. just like, they really had no business really singing these no songs. So I'm like, and I don't want anybody to think that there was lack of parental guidance in my house. There Absolutely wasn't. not. Yeah. We, we were some we were some latchkey kids now. But you know, my grandma was next door, but we we were old enough to know that we shouldn't have been listening to those songs because we knew when to play them and when not to. That's right. And I mean my mom had me in church almost seven days a week back then. So it, okay. it, it, <laughs> she didn't just allow me to say these songs. I just love mm-hmm. music. So right. there was no way around it. And you know what my excuse always was, but I'm playing the clean version. Chris, you didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> you still yeah, know what they mean. Really ain't no clean version mm-hmm. to it. But we were talking about someone. He came up on our all of our lists, Mr. Robert Kelly, on Wednesday of this past week, a New York federal judge sentenced R&B superstar Robert Kelly to 30 years in prison after he was found guilty of nine counts of sex trafficking and racketeering in September. Uh, judge Ann M. Donnelly, who presided over the six week long trial last year in Brooklyn, New York, announced a singer sentencing on Wednesday after hearing statements from Kelly's accusers. Um, He was also ordered to pay a $100,000 fine. Kelly did not address the court, but the defense lawyer for Kelly, Jennifer Bonjean, said Kelly was devastated by the sentence and saddened by what he had heard. He's a human being. He feels what other people are feeling. But that doesn't mean that he can accept responsibility in the way that the government would like him to and other people would like him to because he disagrees with the characterizations that have been made about him. A jury of seven men and five women found the 55-year-old guilty on September 27th after just two days of deliberations. At the time, Mr. Kelly remained motionless with his eyes downcast as the verdict was read. Uh, Through tears and anger, R. Kelly's accusers told a court Wednesday he preyed on them and misled his fans as the fallen R&B star listened with downcast eyes as he awaited sentencing on his federal sex trafficking conviction. One woman told the Grammy-winning multi-platinum selling singer, you made me do things that broke my spirit. I literally wished I would die because of how low you made me feel. Do you remember that? The charges were based on an argument on an argument that Kelly's entourage of managers and aides helped the singer meet girls and keep them obedient and quiet. These actions amounted to a criminal enterprise under federal laws, according to U.S. attorneys. Kelly was also convicted of criminal counts accusing him of violating the Mann Act, which makes it illegal to take anyone across state lines for any immoral purposes. Uh, They are going his his legal team is, of course, eager to file an appeal before the Second Circuit. And um, prosecutors filed a memo on June 8th, stating that Kelly deserved at least 25 years behind bars for sexually abusing women and girls. The singer's lawyer said a sentence of 10 years or less is all he deserves, arguing he should get a break in part because he experienced a traumatic childhood involving severe prolonged childhood sexual abuse, poverty, and violence. So, um, you know, one of the things, I, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll briefly touch on this, uh, just giving a, a quick account of what the accuser said during the sentencing. Um, one woman said uh, she had lost hope in the legal system, but now she feels that there is, she, her faith was restored. She said that R. Kelly victimized her after she went to a concert when she was 17. I was afraid, naive, and didn't know how to handle the situation, she said, so she didn't speak up at the time. Silence, she said, is a very lonely place. Hmm. Um, You know, and he still has some other charges in other counties that he has that he is facing, I believe is in two other states. And I believe one is in Illinois, and I don't, I don't, I can't recall where the other state is where he's facing charges. New York, okay. So, 
the thing about it is, you know, he was convicted and was this a Fed case? Uh yeah. Yeah, he has state charges to face too. So Yeah, this is a Fed case. Fed. So he's gonna he's gonna do that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's gonna do that time. My thing is this. I'm fine with him being, you know, sentenced and whatever he had coming to him. Um, What I need to see is these parents be charged as well. Mm -hmm. Because these parents groom these kids knowing the, the chatter about what R. Kelly was doing at the time, knowing that, you know, he had, Married Aaliyah at 15. Aaliyah's mom, too. She needs to be charged, too. Um, all of these uncle. people. Yeah. they are. Well, from my understanding, <laughs> it was the uncle that didn't want them together. From what I heard. Now, I may be wrong. But they all need all the parents that Surviving R. Kelly document that they had documentary that they have. I think it was called Surviving R. Kelly. Was yes. that what it was called? Yes, because it's on Netflix right now. Yeah. All those parents that groom these kids left our left their care, left the, the care of their kids in our in our Kelly's hands. They need to be charged as well. I agree. Because they knew what they were doing. They knew what R. Kelly was about and what they were leading their child into only for a little bit of fame and fortune, which never happened. And let's be honest, let's not act like there isn't a history within the entertainment business of women. I don't I don't what this phrase I want to use women and some men really pimping their kids out for a paycheck. Tina Turner wrote about it in her autobiography about her. Her mom just gave her to Ike. You know, she wasn't a child child, but she was young at the time because Ike was paying her mom. Yeah. So, um, no more R. Kelly music. New R. Kelly music is going to be coming out. Unless he gets them overturned, <laughs> which I I mean, hey, I've seen crazier things happen, so I can't say I, I don't see that happening. But I don't. Maybe he and uh, C. Murder can collaborate. Oh, man. Yeah, it, it just ain't happening for them. But that happened on Wednesday, so Robert is... Did she say her and C. Him and C. Murder yes. Can <laughs> I really gave that some thought, y'all. I was like, Monica can produce it. <laughs> yes, she did. She did that. Technology dictate that that should be able to happen uh, in today's age, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, I as a woman, and I, I say that phrase every episode, but as a woman, you know, I am happy that justice has been served because he is a predator. I mean, mm-hmm. I promise you, if they let him out today, he's going to go sleep with somebody's child within 30 days. He just oh, can't yeah. help. He can't help himself. And I saw where they said after his release, which will he'll be in his 80s by then, that they want to send him to some type of sexual rehabilitation um, center. But, you know, I'm like... Uh, in his 80s? <laughs> right. That's what I'm saying. And I'm not saying there aren't sexual predators in, in their 80s, because coming from a little small country town, I know that that is... Very much a thing. But uh, why don't they do that now? Yeah. Why he's incarcerated. Because part of incarceration, I feel, should be rehabilitation. That's just my take. You're right. Um, There's no doubt in my mind that he was abused. We hear about men all the time, and a lot of men in the entertainment industry have come forward talking about how they were sexually abused at young ages and men are taught that that's some type of badge you know like oh you know I had a sexual encounter with a woman I was nine and she was 20 something you know what I'm saying so there's no doubt in my mind that there was some type of sexual abuse um, that occurred when he was younger Mm. but that's no excuse for what he has done to all of these young girls well he and their parents um so I am in full agreement that the parents need to be charged as well. Absolutely. Go ahead, John. We're all in a in agreement here. Um, I'm glad this monster's locked up. I'm really disappointed that it took this long after his power and influence waned over the decades in order to get to this point. 
because uh, a lot of people were bought off, including the parents, as you two alluded to, um, his cohorts uh, who were complicit in this effort to um, deflower and uh, dehumanize these young uh, young ladies. And I wish it wasn't just him uh, that was being prosecuted to the fullest extent that the law would provide, but uh, all the people who were complicit uh, in this effort as well. In order for this to be uh, fair and just and equitable, uh, I think all parties involved need some form of prosecution and uh, need to pay some sort of restitution, whether it's in the form of monetary means or um, whether being locked up and your civil liberties just being stripped from you and you be locked up so you can sit and reflect. Uh, but a lot of people are getting off and I can understand uh, the Fed wanting a big fish such as Robert Kelly. And then you have the municipalities in Chicago and New York who are probably up for a reelection or something like that for hmm. state and district attorney. That's the only reason they're bringing up charges as well. So um, it's quite sickening when I think about it in, 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 in those facets, but that's just the world that we live in. Everybody's out here uh, looking for clout and um, looking to maintain some sort of monicum of power. And, um, but I'm happy with the verdict. Uh, I question whether or not is he going to actually serve, gonna going to serve 30 years or does he have, is there any possibility parole or has that, has that been details of that been released as of yet? Well, when you are sentenced in a federal case, I think you have to serve at least 85% of it. Yeah, okay. you do. So, so, so more than likely he'll be convicted in the state cases. Yeah. So if yeah. he's convicted in the state cases, uh, is that on top of what he's supposed to serve under federal jurisdiction? Or is that going to run concurrent with the uh, the federal charges, I wonder? That'll be up to the courts. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anything short of being overturned, being appealed and overturned, he's going to be in there for at least at least a good 20 something years. Mm-hmm. Um, now you said something earlier, John. Let me ask you this. So you don't you think if if he had kept his celebrity stat- status in the last 10 years that he had the previous 10 years, you don't think there would have been a conviction? Probably not. If he was uh, if he was a a financial savant and um, was able to pay a lot of people off because we know how this uh, how the legal system works. It's the haves and have nots. And if you have a a fair amount of financial resources, you can uh, basically get yourself out of uh, many predicaments that people who are not financially um, uh, or in financial scarcity uh, they're not going to be privy to the same opportunity uh, to get themselves out of uh, legal quandaries. So that's just that's just my feeling. If 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 that's off base, it is what it is. But um, I think the fact that he essentially ran out of that financial um, uh, the financial monies that he was able to acquire over the decades mm-hmm. and keep the I, I assume the, the legal process at bay or not even pay uh not even a, being able to pay off some of his cohorts uh, uh the dams and or the levies broke at that particular point and that's when all jurisdictions from the federal to the state level uh were looking to bring up charges on him that's just my thought mm, okay wow well all right it's kelly you did you did the crimes? Time to do the time, brother. We're gonna I... get you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fish. <laughs> ah, it ain't funny, but you know. Yeah. yeah. Again, I do help to see these these uh something happen with these parents that led them to please let those kids start killing. In some other news that happened, um, John, I'll have you go through that. It was a horrifying and despicable shooting that happened this past week in Ohio. John, go ahead and touch on that, please. Yes, there was a police-involved shooting in Akron, Ohio. Uh, I'm just going to read this uh, this article put out by Reuters. Uh, this came out this past Saturday. 
Um, now, bear in mind, uh, in this article, it does m- make reference that the police body cam footage will be made public. As of today, there will be a news conference uh, by the police department. Um, I'll just say the municipality of Akron uh, as a as a whole in reference to this incident. So as the article states, uh, police killed Jalen Walker a black man in Ohio by shooting him dozens of times as he ran from officers following a traffic stop. A lawyer for his family said, citing a review of police body worn camera footage due to be made public as of today, as I mentioned before. Um, Comments by the Akron Beacon Journal uh, attorney Bobby DiCello described the video as brutal and said Walker's relatives worried that protests this weekend could turn violent. They had to shut down uh, 4th of July uh, festivities this week. That's how uh, bad it is. The shooting was the latest in a spate of killings of black men by law enforcement in the United States that critics say are unjustified. We're all bracing for the community's response. And the one message that we have is the family does not need any more violence, the cello said. This is the lawyer for the family. Akron police said, have said, Walker, 25, fired a gun at officers who were pursuing him. They plan to release their body footage, as I mentioned before, following a news conference on Sunday. There is a scheduled protest uh, or march uh, scheduled for that same day or around the same time as the news conference. Uh, Roger Pound, senior pastor of the Second Baptist Church in Akron, said during a prayer rally on Saturday that uh, protest is a way of crying. And um, he was actually one of the ones permitted to see the video. Uh, He didn't provide uh, too much, uh, but he called the footage shocking, saying that it showed Walker posed no threat when he was shot down in the manner the pastor likened to a massacre. Ninety times. Ninety times. And he has about 60 to 80 wounds on his body. And they can't tell whether or not those are entry or exit wounds. That's how bad it was. It's barbaric, Pound said in an interview with the local television uh, uh, news station. You'll see tomorrow. Or today, rather. Officials have said the deadly confrontation began when officers tried to stop Walker for a traffic violation while he was driving early Monday morning. Walker fled, according to the Akron Police Department, which said officers reported a gun being fired from Walker's vehicle. After several minutes, Walker exited his vehicle and ran, without his gun, mind you, while officers chased him on foot and fired at him, saying he was presented as a deadly threat. Walker was pronounced dead in the parking lot where he fell. Police representatives did not immediately respond to requests for comment on Saturday. Uh, The family lawyer said his team, of course has not seen any evidence Walker fired a weapon and that police body cam footage showed him running with his back to officers when they gunned him down. He is just in a down sprint when he is dropped by, I think, the count is more than 90 shots. The channel told the Beacon Journal. Now, how many of those land according to our investigation right now? We're getting details that suggest 60 to 80 wounds. It was not clear how many bullets struck Walker because bullets can cause wounds both entering and exiting the body. The preliminary report from the medical examiner's office found Walker sustained multiple gunshot wounds to his head, torso, and legs, and that a weapon was recovered from a car, but Ohio's Bureau of Investigation, uh, though it did not specify which car it came from. Uh, Pounds told, and this is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, at this, the pastor, uh, that Walker did not have a weapon when he was shot. It was in his car. Compounded the tragedy, according to the Beacon Journal, Walker's fiance had died in a car accident last month. Oh, man. Oh, Jesus. Those cited attorneys for his family as saying Walker had no intention of harming himself or others when he was killed. The officers mm-hmm. involved are on a paid vacation right now, i.e. administrative leave. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So body cam footage will be made available today after their press conference. Mm. And this is um, the, the man after he was 
shot at 90 times, struck 60 to 80 times while he was on. Yeah, they handcuffed him on the ground until the medical examiner got there to, to um, pronounce him dead. As if after being shot 60 to 80 times, he was going to jump up and keep running. That's barbaric. He was a still a perceived threat after death. <sighs> 60 to 80 rounds. So there were eight officers, seven were white, one was of color, person of color. Um, I believe the medical examiner initially has uh, uh, viewed this as a homicide or listed the uh, this killing as a homicide. Right uh, now, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, oh my god, <laughs> this is. Um, I don't want to say that. The worst thing to say right now is to say that I'm numb to it, but it happens all too often. To where. For me, there's no shock in it now. You do you, y'all do y'all kind of get where I'm coming from with that? Mm-hmm. That's my exact feeling. It it doesn't it doesn't register like out of the whole thing that you just read, John. The the one thing that just made me go, "Oh my God!" was his fiance dying in a car accident a month before. Yeah. I think they uh, just placed that in there just to, I guess, frame what his mindset would have been because he didn't have any priors, uh, any criminal uh, priors uh, prior to this uh, this incident uh, or actually his 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 untimely demise. Um, Only traffic tickets. uh, That's it. Uh, So I I just think they just placed that in there to frame what his mindset would have been to uh, him, allow him to make the decision to flee. law enforcement um Hmm. just after it was just i guess a a traffic stop uh, a routine traffic stop so it became an extraordinary traffic stop when he decided to flee but um still so they couldn't um, tase him they said initially they tried to tase him tried tried to tase him Hmm. they didn't try hard enough apparently so after trying uh, one attempt they said you know what let's just empty our clips and then put in more clips and empty them. But you're not a threat af- as you are fleeing uh, law enforcement. You're not a perceived threat unless he was firing back. But he wasn't firing back. He didn't even he wasn't armed at that time. Yeah. So he, to, in in my view, once again, policing is very hard. Mm-hmm. Let's not you know forget that 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 fact. Policing is very hard. Uh, but I don't think it's that difficult uh, to see that there's eight of you, there's one of him, and he exit exits his vehicle. And runs away, uh, seeking safety. And the automatic response is basically, I, I just liken this to a firing squad because that's essentially what it was. Especially if he got hit sixty to eighty times. That's barbaric. Yeah. A man was killed here uh, last week, week before last, by the police, and there was nothing. Like Keith said, it's so common now. It's just no coverage on it. Locally. Yeah. But that's it. And there was no, like, no one spoke about it. The mayor made no comments. Well, of course he did. He's on the side of police. Uh, (laughs) So, you know, um, it was just very sad because the man was mentally ill and he did have a knife, but they shot him because he wouldn't come out of his house. It was his house. He mm. wouldn't come outside because the neighbor reported that he was a homeless man and he was squatting. Oh, he was just mentally ill. He owned the home and no charges were brought up against the police. Mm. It just makes um, it. it uh, it's exhausting. A, it's exhausting. Yeah, it's, it's exhausting. We don't have too, so many words or can't really eloquently put together um <laughs> conscious thought because it just happens so often so but you know what Uh, (laughs) we people and I'm including myself we the thing about it is you know even though it's a cycle on their parts too they're going to kill black people we get outraged for about three weeks we protest throw tantrums in the street we go back to normal 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't pause supporting these businesses that support and fund the police. Yeah. Um, yeah. We don't go out, you know, I have my thing about voting now, but we go and we vote for these candidates because they're black um, instead of uh, well, you know, digging into them and seeing if, you know, they are supporters of these people that are killing black, black and brown faces. Um, and I'm guilty of that, you know, with, with Andre Dickens. I fully supported him not knowing he was, you know, <laughs> who he is. A yeah. phony, you know what I'm saying? So it's like we we don't do our homework. And I'm not saying that we're to blame before anybody puts words in my mouth. Um, but I just think that we don't apply enough pressure. We don't hold them accountable. Yeah, um, we don't. And it, and, it, and it is our fault. I'm going to say it for you. Mm -hmm. You you don't feel that way. I'm going to say it. It is our fault because we allow these candidates to get in our face to tell us how, why we should be voting for them, what they're going to do, what how they're going to help us. And then the minute they get in, they spit in our face pretty much and help everybody else mm -hmm. but us. And Roger, I mean, not just uh, local. I, know. I just I have to call him out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel you, you know, but no. local and, you know, na you know, nationally, it, it just we, we allow these candidates. W listen, we sat right there as a collective, as black people. And we said, oh, my God, Donald Trump is horrible. And listen, some of the words that come out of that man's mouth was just ignorant, stupid and crazy. But we didn't sit back and look at some of the things that, you know, behind the scenes he may have been doing. And again, I'm not advocating for him. I'm just seeing what I was seeing. Um, you know, some of the, the, the monies that he was giving to these historical black colleges and things like that. We let another man come in our face and tell us that if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Oh. And guess what? We voted for him. He hates us. <laughs> we, we let that same man talk down to our black leaders when they held a little phone conference trying to hold him accountable for a few things, and he talked down to him, to them. And this is before he got elected. And guess what? We still elected him. And we also allowed him to use a black woman with a very shady background. Yes. <laughs> yes. And she threw on her pearls and her chucks yeah. to get the votes. And I say we. Yeah. And I say we. Oh, I'm going to include myself in there because listen, baby. Same they here. Fooled, they fooled me. Same they here. They fooled me. And now I'm disgusted at my choice. Listen, I can be very transparent. I sat there when I went and voted. Mm -hmm. and I did not vote with my brain and I do everything with my brain, not with my heart. Sometimes that's bad. Right. Mm -hmm. But I do everything with my brain, but I sat there and I said, Oh man, we can't have agent orange in there. no more. He's too terrible. He's too horrible. Mm -hmm. Not realizing that this man that we, I was about to vote for has a history, a history going back to the seventies and probably before then. Of being against black people. So does his black but because, female vice president. Correct. But because he was the vice president of the first half black president. Because he had a a black half black woman running with him as vice president. I got swayed. And I'm telling you, that was that was the longest time I ever took in a voting booth to 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 to, to circle or fill in who I was voting for. I sat there for about a good 12 minutes. Oh, excuse me, y'all. Headphones <laughs> fell off. I sat, I sat there for, I stood there for a good 12 minutes because I felt in my soul and my brain was telling me, do not circle Democrat. And I was like, no, we have to have change. Realizing for the last 30 years, there's been no change no matter who's in the office. Uh, before then, I'm just going to use the last 30 years. 
But I said, no, this is going to be change. No, it isn't. So I do hold us as black people accountable because we have a voice. We have voting power. We're the ones that's pushing these people, the blues, over the finish line. Yeah. And in turn, they turn and spit in our face. Because look at Georgia. We were all excited about turning Georgia blue with Warnock and Ossoff, and nothing has changed. As a matter of fact, things in Georgia have gotten worse. Uh, Hello. And See, I'm know, from the state of Florida, baby. Ain't, ain't yeah. I listen? We could be all blue, and I know, <laughs> I know what state we in. I ain't work. You, you can tell me all day long. It's gonna be a chain. I'm be like, yeah, okay. And the sun is about to hit the earth right now, as you but, say that. But for some reason, as much as I have distrusted her in the past, I just have a gut feeling that if we black people in Georgia can get out there and get Stacey Abrams in that governor's seat. Hmm. I do believe that's going to start a change in Georgia. It will. It will. Because now it's going to be very, it's going to be very violent and very messy mm-hmm. the first couple of years because of the white folks up there being very upset. Mm-hmm. Y'all let that Negro woman from the South get into that chair. Because mm-hmm. I've I've expressed to people, um, no matter if if Stacy's in or if if. Kemp wins again. I want out of here. And I keep saying that because I'm trying to manifest it and I'm trying to get my prayer warriors on it. I have to leave Georgia. Um, <laughs> the climate here is as a woman, as a black woman, it is too dangerous for me to continue to live here. And people love mm-hmm. to say, well, you're in Metro Atlanta. It's still Georgia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's still the dirty South. And as a hey, you're not, and you don't live in Metro Georgia, uh, Atlanta, you live in the outskirts. Well, I, they really in, do the I don't live in the city of Atlanta. I live in Metro right. Atlanta. Well, you, I'm sorry. Yeah, you don't live Atlanta. in the city. Yeah, I don't right. live in the so. city. So, but, you know, we're, we're still right here. And even here where I am, it's not bad. But if I travel about 20 miles south to Henry County, it's a totally different climate. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm just like, I want out of here. Um it, I just feel it's too dangerous, especially with Roe versus Wade being overturned, because you already know Georgia already voted to ban abortion. Mm-hmm. And now, so it's just a matter of time before it's like, OK. And, um, you know, not that I'm out here actively seeking to get an abortion. But as we explained before, there are other things that come into play as well. So I want out of here. Like, I'm not going to stop until I leave, until I'm gone. But, um, you know, it's it's. I'm not going to lie to you. Since the presidential election, I have not been back in a voting booth. Um, and I know I'm going to get some some slack for that, especially from my family. But I'm the type of person, I am a heart decision maker. Um, and I make no apologies for that because some people be like, you got to think with your head sometimes. Well, I do that nine to five Monday through Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so I am a heart type of decision maker and my heart hasn't been in it. Um, I've been real discouraged when it comes to that because I'm one of those people that at this particular moment, and it could change. I feel like me voting doesn't make a difference and I don't like wasting my time. It hasn't. I mean, let's just be honest. Our voting has not made a difference. It really hasn't. And I'm one of the ones that is probably Nine, I'm 98% sure I'm going to sit out this election. Oh, absolutely. This election. Now, I, uh, I am going to vote for Stacey Abrams. Mm. Now, I am going to vote uh, for the governor of the state. Mm-hmm. Um, because, oof, yeah. But yeah. but then again, that that within itself can create some possibilities if if the voting goes the other way because if we keep him here that that's that's for us here as a state but if we don't vote him here that just accelerates his plans to either be vp or president and uh i do believe that he is gaining more popularity than trump Mm. um in the republican party and i do believe that he is going to be the one to take on um, uh, Biden. If I'm sure Biden is going to want to rerun at 90 years old, probably. Um, but he's going to be the one that's going to run against. Biden. I just I have this feeling. I feel I feel like it's going to come down to DeSantis and Trump, and Trump supporters are going to turn on him because they're going to he's going to come back with that vaccination 
um, thing that a lot of Trump supporters are were and still are against and booed the man about saying that you need to get vaccinated. So um, that's just my opinion on it. But, but you know, I ain't vote. Yeah, with them, it's a, and you know, and I thought about this too because I fully intended to go volunteer to work on Stacey's um, campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, but the only reason I have not and probably still will not is because I feel it's too dangerous for me to do so. Um, not in with with the Trumpers, as I love to call them, or or those you know the Republicans and stuff. Here's the thing: they either love him or they hate him. The side that loves Trump, they love Trump because he takes the hoods off for them. He allows them to. He says what they're thinking, what they've been feeling, but what they've been too afraid to say all this time. Mm. But then you have Mm -hmm. some that hate him because it's like, we don't want you to take the hoods off because we want to be seen as these upstanding people. We're not racist. We're Christians. We love everybody. We still want to get the black vote. We hate the black voters, but we still want their votes. And Trump kind of turns that off for them. So, you know, it's division, even though it's division among that side of the fence. Mm -hmm. They still sometimes support and vote for one another. But oh, on yeah. the other side of the fence, and I'm not going to say our side of the fence because I don't claim to be Democrat or Republican. Mm-hmm. Um, because I have like um, aligned myself with both of those parties at one time or another. Um, with with the other side of the fence, it's like they're going to be divided and they're going to let you know they're divided. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's no unity. There's no, and they, you know, they don't stand together. So they would rather lose a lot of battles for the sake of I'm going to stand my ground as opposed to coming together and holding things down t- for the good of the people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the problem for me. There's no unity on a side that's supposed to unify the people. That's right. John, are you, are you still feeling the same way you were? when you voted in this last election? Man, my mind was already made up um, when I went to that voting booth to uh, get Agent Orange out of there. Mm-hmm. Now I am just beyond disillusionment uh, with this whole democratic process. And um, uh, this I, I can't stand uh, Joe Biden and his administration. Him and Kamala Harris and this inept uh, Democratic uh, or Democrat, rather, uh, Congress that has majority that has not been able to uh, do anything substantive um, at all in reference to uh, black America at large, uh, mostly. Um, Whenever there's a Republican in it, they get shit done, uh, regardless if it's popular or unpopular. They get shit done. They don't care. <laughs> they don't care. They don't care about your feelings. They don't care if it's popular or not. They don't care if 90% of Americans don't want this. They're going to get stuff done. And a part of me really appreciates that. It, it, can't it help really but does. respect it. I can't really help but respect that. Just like Jehovah's Witnesses. They're there. Hail of high water at your door. Everybody's door is stopped. That's I right. respect it. They're very consistent and persistent in getting through their agendas. There, that they probably didn't normally verbalize uh, during the campaign trail, but they get stuff done. But uh, Joe Biden and his um, anti-black ass, um, I can't I honestly can't I can't stand them. And I uh, <laughs> I'm uh, ashamed that I actually voted for this dude. Woo. Yeah, I'm ashamed I voted for this dude. Because I feel if I would have just, you know, as you stated, Keith, voted with your heart, not your head, mm-hmm. <laughs> I would have gone with Agent Orange and I probably wouldn't. I At least I know where I stand with this guy. Right. Yeah. I know where I stand. That's right. There's, I don't have to question anything with 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 uh, Joe Biden. Hey, guess what? He's going to give us a little crumbs, too, now. I, Trump, go, Trump. I'm saying Trump gonna give us some crumbs. Biden Absolutely. ain't gonna give us nothing. Except you're in a state of chaos all the time. <laughs> I'm in a state of chaos, anarchy. Mm. There's no order whatsoever. And then the fact <laughs> this guy, <laughs> this guy is mentally challenged. I'm sorry. 
He's freaking <laughs> mentally challenged. He's old and demented. Like yes. that's the one thing um Donald Trump said that I did agree with. Like this man has dementia. Yeah, yeah, he does. There's and facts and facts over feelings, folks. I mean, I said what I said. He's he's mentally uh he's he's mentally challenged. He's he's yeah. vexed right now. Yeah. And um, I should have taken all that information because I'm very analytical and I take information. And for whatever reason, I said, nope, based on the performance of the last four years, I didn't like this. So I need to go ahead and, and seek change. And uh, we've taken uh, 5,000 steps back. Since <laughs> he's been in office. You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, great dialogue, guys. Before we get into this last uh, subject that has become a phenom over the last week on the internet, I want to tell you guys something. I I went to Burn Steakhouse again this past weekend, yesterday actually, on uh, Saturday. (laughs) (laughs) Me and my wife were invited. And, you know, as you grow, you get, as you get older, your taste buds, for me, taste buds change. I add certain things to my um, my diet that I had not eaten before, never thought I would have a taste for, and things of that nature, right? So, of course, when I was younger and everything, um, you know, I always had my steaks well done. Always. Mm-mm. It better be well, well done. <laughs> I mean, that's the only way I can eat it, right? So, trans, and I've never been a big steak eater. That's, I'll throw that out there. I've never been big on steaks. I don't need steaks. Give me chicken, I'm good. Um, then I got into my early 30s and mid 30s, and I was like, okay, let me do medium well. And, um, been I was doing that for a very long time. In the last two years, I would say I've started to get my steaks medium. Who yes, Lord. Lord and wow, is all I can say. It has changed the way my mindset of what I thought medium well medium was, as opposed to well done. Medium I felt was this bloody, uncooked nasty tasting still tastes like the cow steak and it isn't it's so delicious and i was like wow you know so i just want to say that you know it just kind of i was like wow i you know I, I, I as i was eating the steak last night i had a delmonico ribeye and um oh, you know just reflecting on how my taste buds have changed but on to better things. Before we get out of here, wanted to touch base on this um, thing that has swept the internet in the past week. Steph, can you walk <laughs> us through <laughs> this drama that has um, gone through the internet? So there was this young lady who posted a video where she was outraged, just going off, um, which we came later to find out was a fake, a phony. It was a skit. But the subject matter is still relevant, um, where the father of one of her children, was, she said, was showing up daily at her house with McDonald's for his child and his child only, and not the other kids. Now, she in, in the middle of all this, she was screaming, you know, we, we're still sleeping together from time to time. And, you know, he, he wants, you know, would do things for my other kids. And she didn't think it was fair. So once again, it became a battle of the sexes across Facebook. And you had some women. Wait a minute, uh, Steph. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. So it was a skit? Yeah, it was a skit. Oh. This this wow. woman only has one child. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. So it even went so far where you have some women, you know, they are calling men these despicable names. And the women that agree with the man who said, I'm I'm responsible to feed my child and, and I'm obligated to feed my child and my child only. Um, I even saw a couple of comments from people saying that women who think like that, um, and I'm one of them, uh, would be trash as stepmothers. Um, and my whole take on all of this, um, for me, even though the courteous thing 
the decent thing to do would be to bring food for all of the kids because if it were me, I would. I'm going to feed babies, everybody. Um, He's only, I, I hate that the word obligated was thrown around, saying he was obligated to feed all of these women's children. And he's obligated, especially if there are court orders in place, to feed his child and his child only. Now, should maybe he could have picked his child up and taken his child away somewhere else to eat instead of feeding him in front of the kids because it can cause some friction between siblings. But I don't like that that word obligated is being thrown around because he's obligated to his child and his child only, which goes back to how it seems. And ladies, you're going to crucify me, but I love y'all and I don't care how we try to set all of these rules for how men should behave in these situationships, but we never want to set rules for how the women should behave and how um, things should occur. I.e., we bash men for having multiple children, but there were some people that came to the table and, you know, they were like, you know, well, you got multiple children from multiple men. You know, things like this are going to happen. So I think my thing is, where do we draw the line between um, obliga obligations and ridiculous expectations? Wow. Okay. Um, John, you got thoughts on that? On, on that whole post and self thoughts uh i shouldn't be surprised that that entire stunt was a uh hmm. was a work and uh <laughs> in wrestling terms work, shoot. <laughs> 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 or a shoot or, but you know actual and in, in, in an actual real life instance of uh uh cone uh, uh co-parenting gone awry but um I'm in agreement with Steph. Uh, yeah, the courteous thing, but I would have been to buy all the kids uh, some food from McDonald's. But if that were me and um, uh, we're no longer together and essentially just like when you are severed from a job or you remove yourself from a job, all benefits cease for all other parties involved other than the ones that I am uh, obligated to take care of. So in that instance, if my son or daughter needs something to eat, I will bring my son or daughter something to eat. Now, if um, I'm worried about optics, I would remove my child from the household so that my child can go ahead and have uh, nourishment. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the man or the woman in that situation shouldn't feel entitled to someone else's financial resources, especially if the person had no... Uh, involvement with creating other said children. Uh, they shouldn't be entitled to uh, said person's resources uh, just because you feel that's the right thing to do or you uh, are entitled to uh, that benefit. Uh, those benefits are once again uh, voided uh, once the relationship has been separate. And at that particular point, if the two of you have a child and only have one child, then you should co-parent based on fact that you two have that one child together and there should be no expectation zero expectation that well christmas is coming around and i have three other kids that aren't his so i know he's going to buy him some jordan so the expectation is the other three should have jordans on his dime no he should buy his kids jordans and jordans alone and i'm not endorsing jordans because i have no allegiances to jordan i'm just using that as an example so if it's mcdonald's i don't care what it is He's beholden to that child because those two decide to have that one child. He needs to take care of that one child. He needs to be involved in the nourishment of that one child. And there should not be any expectation to feed two, three, four others in that case. Otherwise, it's utterly ridiculous and um, not within reason to expect that type of benefit. Yeah, I mean... I, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that if I know there's other kids at the house, I wouldn't bring any food because I would. You know, that's just me. Right. Right. But if I want to take my child out. Well, first off, there's, there's, there's the one thing that 
everyone needs to understand is communication is key, right? If my child is at the mother's house, hey, um, just want to let you know I want to bring my child. I'm going to bring my child something to eat. Do the other kids have something to eat? Because I mean, did they, you know, did they get something from their fathers or something from the outside? Because if not, I'm going to take my child out to eat because then I don't want to make it uncomfortable and create a tense situation for my child in the house, right? Right. Because he has something that the others don't. Second of all, you don't know what's in a person's pockets, right? So if I can only, I got $5 and my child's going to get those last $5, then that's what it's going to be. But if, you know, hey, I'm going to get everybody, you know, I'm going to go to Wendy's, get everybody four for foes, spend $12, call it a day. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, go that's pick cool. Up two hot and ready's. Right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> That can, that can easily be placated. But if I want to do something in particular mm-hmm. for my child, um, I should not be subjected to, well, you you know that he, I have other kids. Yeah, you, you said it. There's the correct wording of that. I have, not we, I have other kids. Because come Christmas time, I'm not going to go with the intent of, oh, I can't get my child this because maybe his other brothers and sisters won't have it. Mm-hmm. Again, it comes down to responsibility. And then Steph said something earlier that I don't think gets talked about enough is that there is never any accountability held for the mothers in those type of situations. And it's always for the fathers, either the father's not doing enough, either the father's not 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 present. Now is the father's not doing for the other kids that aren't his. You know what I mean? So when does that responsibility start leaning on? the the mother side of things when it comes to that um you know hey we all do things that you know maybe in hindsight we should have done yeah she may have multiple fathers but okay that is not any one of those fathers responsibility or fault for doing for their child and the other one and they're not doing for the others right as john alluded to earlier my child tells me that they want these brand new jordans i'm not going to say no daughter, son, I can't do that for you because your siblings will not get those from their father either. No. <laughs> My child yeah. asked for that. I'm going to get it. And if that's all I can afford, which, you know, those type of shoes and uh-huh. that stuff, that's all you can afford. I mean, it's totally different if you're getting them a game uh, a, 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 a game console. That's their game console, but they can share that with their siblings in the home. Uh, in their at their mother's home, but you do not put the onus on telling the, the the father. You know that's not right. You know you don't know. You're right. You have other kids, and because you fail to manage your money, and now you're waiting to the eleventh to get your food stamps, it's my fault. And you know what? I one thing that bothers me as a woman who I have several female friends who are unmarried with children. And there are situations with the dads of these children, with maybe the exception of one, my friend Nakia. I, I've never had this happen with her. Um, but all, all of the rest of them, I'll go so far as to say all of the rest of them. There have been situations where they have done something that's been dead wrong when it comes to um, the fathers of their children. And it's like you sit back and you can't really say anything. And I'm one of those friends. I like the accountability factor with my friends. You can't say anything because the first time one of them comes out of their mouth and that's my child and you don't even have any kids, it's going to be a problem. So I'm just like, "Mm, okay, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Do what you got to do with your kid. But it just, it, it breaks my heart because they do all of these crazy things. And I say crazy because it's crazy. Some of the things that my friends do when it comes to the fathers of their children is just outright crazy to me. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and that's why when I ended up getting pregnant, I had lots of questions, you know, like, well, why are you giving this baby his last name? That's his father. Wow. Wow. First of all, why, why are you, first of all, why are they even asking you that question? Yeah. That's none of their that? MF and why, business. Why are you doing this? What, like, the whole Bruh, time stay in your lane. Right. You know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah. why are you even asking that question to your friend? So even, you know, even though I was just carrying the child, the child was not physically here. Like I included Christopher in every decision, every day. Like, what do you think? What is, because that's the other parent, whether that parent and I are going to be together or not. 
that parent does and you know, um, one of my friends that I went to high school with, her favorite line is, he doesn't have any rights. And I'm like, but that's still her father, mm. you know, and her child is six now. But I'm like, that's still her father. You know what I'm and saying? You, like, and you know what, Steph? And you know what happens then? Mm -hmm. These kids get older and find out that their mothers were keeping were the them problem. away from their fathers mm -hmm. and were the problem. And then, yes. then they end up turning on their mothers. And then the mothers are sitting there going, why? And how many, same time, reason. how many times have we seen that among some of our friends and family when they grow up and they find out that mama was the problem? Right. Because right. so it's like, um, you know, and that's heartbreaking because, you know, sometimes as adults, when we become adults and we find out that mom and dad are not who we thought mom and dad were. And I'm not saying that in a bad thing because I don't want my mama uh, as a bad thing because I don't want my mama to tear my head off. Mm -hmm. But. You learn things about your parents when you get older. You're like, oh, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, mama isn't perfect. Daddy wasn't perfect. You know what I'm saying? But I have had too many of my friends come to me and be like, all of these years, I thought my dad was the problem. It wasn't my dad. It was my mom. Keeping, mm -hmm. purposely keeping me away from my father. And situations like that break my heart because, you know, and I'm not saying I'll do that, but I just had to just do a quick mental scan of my friends. And I'm just like, I just came up with Nakia. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Nakia. I know she listens. Um, that's just like hadn't done something at one time or another that made me go like, mm, I'm going to stay out of this because you're not mm -hmm. going to like what I have to say about it. Mm -hmm. um, so... That's a situation where this woman, and I don't bash anybody. I think babies are blessings. I'm not going to bash anybody for having multiple kids for multiple people. But some of the people that made the comments of, you know, those of you who think that way, you would be a trash step parent. I have to look at them. Mm -hmm. I have to consider the source because there were a couple of people I'm like, oh, I would be a trash step parent. Where are your kids right now? Yeah. Where are your kids every night while you clubbing? Yeah. Where are your kids when you going on all of these trips? Like, you know, and those are questions that are none of my business, but don't you dare ever tell somebody that they're going to be a trash step parent when your parenting skills are questionable. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah that whole situation, it just, it sparked a lot of debate and it made me look at a whole lot of people in a totally different light. Yeah. 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 You just, you know, Everybody's different, but I, I do, I would like to say to those that are raising their kids, whether it's the mother or father, be mindful of what you're telling that child mm -hmm. about that other parent, because it will backfire on you. Right. It's going to backfire on you, whether you realize it or not, it's going to backfire. So those first 17, 18 years you have of feeding that child all that negative information and negative energy, it's going to backfire on you because that child is going to come to the truth and that relationship will never be the same. Never. So, um, well, we have come to the end. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say this. One of the things that I talked about before is our Patreon page. We're still working on that Patreon page. We hope to have that going by next week's episode. We'll start sending out notifications and information on our social media accounts. If you do choose to sign up for the Patreon page, you'll be, you know, get some exclusive things like, you know, you may get merch. You, you know, also we'll be doing our podcast with video for our Patreon people. Um, we'll also have some extra episodes uploaded with video or without video, whatever you choose to do. Um, we're doing that Patreon page for. So we're going to give out some more information on that by next week's episode, episode 76. So you'll know where to subscribe and how to subscribe and all that information that you'll need. So we'll do it for, you know, on social media. And then for those of you all that do not have social media, you just stay tuned to episode 76 and we'll have that information for you um i you know we talked about the usher um tiny desk and it came out right after that horrible verses I, I you know we didn't get a chance to talk about it today but i will say this if you have not had a chance to 
please take the time out to go on YouTube and pull up Usher's Tiny Desk. It is 24 minutes of a master class of singing, performing. I mean, he is just one of the best to ever do it. Um, and the way that they changed the melodies to some of his more up-tempo songs to give it a more of an adult sound and feel to some of those songs, it was just, it was a masterclass. So um, please take the time out to check those out when you get a moment. Again, stay tuned on Tuesday for our social media accounts where the top 10 for episode 76 is dropping. So you can go and vote in the stories and everything that we're doing with the podcast. We want to thank you so much for supporting us, for downloading us, um, you know, for just really sticking by us with everything. And Steph, go right ahead and tell us about the spotlight city of this episode this week. Um, we want to give a shout out this week to Pflugerville. That's with a P. <laughs> Texas. Um, Pflugerville, Texas is in Travis County and it has a population of 65,191. Um, some interesting facts about Pflugerville um, that I was looking Where is it at now? What state? Travis Texas. County, Texas. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, Michael Johnson, who played safety in the NFL, uh, won a ring with the Giants in 2008. He's from Pflugerville. Um, also, Pooh Shiesty, for those who know Pooh Shiesty, the, the rapper from Memphis. Well, he, he was born in Memphis. Um, he lived in Pflugerville for a while. And also, there were a few um, movies and, and television series that were filmed in Pflugerville to include What's Eating Gilbert Grape, Texas Chainsaw mm. Massacre, Friday Night Lights, American Crime, and Transformers Age of Extinction. Ooh, okay. Really? Yes. Wow. In that little town of 65,000. So, Pflugerville, Texas, we thank you. Man, thank I always you. liked that movie, Was Eating Gilbert Grape. Me too. It was so sad, but I liked it. It was. Yeah. John, did you ever see Was Eating Gilbert Grape? A long time ago, and I, I'm having a hard time recalling any of the uh, scenes from that movie. So, I'm going to have to watch it again. Yeah. yeah. Leonardo and Johnny in the same yeah. movie. Yeah. Yeah. But well, I think the thing that shocked me was about Transformers. They had a lot of their scenes filmed there. Ah, uh, you know yeah. what? Now I can see how they, when they were out in the country, probably when, uh, that's probably where, um, uh, what's the guy's name? Mark Wahlberg lived. Mm -hmm. Some of those out in the country scenes. It, it makes sense. Cause that does even look like where what's eating Gilbert grape was kind of shot at and at those type yeah. of scenes. They said a lot of the houses, they're really old. Like most mm -hmm. of them being over a hundred years old. So I can, yeah, I can see that. Mm -hmm. Probably they shot Rambo. Mm -hmm. That last Rambo I saw. That Rambo movie was good. I was never a big Rambo fan, but that last one was pretty good. I think that was the last mm -hmm. one. Yeah. All right. Well, we are the Short Desk Podcast. Holla at your girl and your boys. Hey, I got a lot of money on you, man. Well, well, you's getting ready to be a rich nigga. You see, because come next week, I, I, I'm knocking somebody the fuck out. <laughs>